set, my mind is set, my grind is set, my heart on ice cold. I'm only here to even a scope. Whoa. My mind is set, my grind is set, my heart on ice cold. We down right now, but did it before. Whoa. See from here we go up, made the call, I shown up. Now the game is sold up, say my name is blown up. We up, we up. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Night at Ones podcast. I have to get this out of the way. I apologize for my voice. It's not what it normally is. I'm uh, coming off of a pretty bad cold, and I'm still recovering. So uh, just like our football team, we're still going to be recovering for this bye week. That being said, welcome back to episode number 64. Uh, We are the only podcast that features a former UCF national champion, a former UCF radio host, an ESPN analyst and hoops player, an infamous rapper, our resident influencer and IG star shooting the breeze talking UCF sports. Remember to like us and follow us on YouTube, IG, and check out the 70 plus teams and conferences on the college huddle, the Big 12 huddle, fourth in Florida, and our new stream, which will eventually kick off next year. Um, That being said, let's go ahead and bring in uh, the man of the hour, the man of every week, the guy that makes this thing possible. No, bro. Hey, now. What's going hey, on? now. All right. Dude, what's up with your hair? It's kind of like laying down today. Do you have like gel going on? What, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, I got a new product and I put it in it. It's more coily. Oh, this is a new product. I see. Mm-hmm. I see. All right. Well, give us the hair flip. Let's see if it uh, works as well with the product. And eh, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I'd say we go product less. Uh-huh. Um, uh next uh let's go ahead and bring out the largest and tallest uh pod ucf podcaster in ucf history ben stout what's up what's up yeah it's unfortunately we're uh we're discussing another ucf football loss we're gonna try to help each other get through it and help night nation get through it we'll see yeah Uh, certainly a frust- frustrating one but as trey says we're a basketball school school now so Speaking of Trey, let's go ahead and bring him to the stage. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Ben Stout, hair flip. There it is. All right. All right. Uh, Next, next, uh, we've got Trey Neal. Welcome back to the stage, Trey Neal. How frustrated are you? You're going to be yelling at clouds this week or what? No, I'm not that frustrated this week. (laughs) I thought they played played pretty well. Um, But, I mean, key plays. Key mistakes cost us, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, uh, they played pre- pretty well, except for special teams. So um, that special teams was special this week and uh, especially got, got us lost. I will say, last but not least, but always last, but Josh Lazar and Alan Levin are not with us this week. So I will say last, but certainly not least, Andrew Fagley. Welcome back to the show. Uh, how you guys doing? Good to be back. Good. Yeah, man. Good to have you. Uh, for those of you that are newer listeners, uh, which I don't think many of you are, but those that are that don't remember from the uh, the AP uh, and the Nightline days, Andrew Fagley is the godfather of UCF podcasting. Started UCF's first uh, podcast mm-hmm. and uh, certainly got me into both uh, the podcast world, the radio world, and uh, laid the foundation for this podcast. So welcome back, AP. And he usually is good for at least three hot takes a show. So oh, yeah. he'll spice it up a little bit since I'm uh, since I'm a little under the weather. So um, all let's, hot takes. let's all hot takes. Yeah. All hot takes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do anything um, but hot takes. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to this week because there was a uh, there was some hot flaming. Uh, decisions uh, that uh, happened this week and on our coaching staff. But uh, before we we get started with that, let's get into a little bit of text talk. Um, ben, did you actually pull your text talk this week, or, or are we going to wait? Uh, you and- can, uh, let me find one real quick. I'll find. <laughs> it. We do it every I don't week. Know why you always go to me because I because I don't have them. Uh, yeah, that's exactly why I always go. Oh, to is me. this like? Is this like a? Uh- Here's a quick one. Here's a quick Find one. Stupid texts. 
No, this is this is our text thread that we have. Uh, we always oh, share oh, ours. The 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 game. I'm in too, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. How about, how about a simple one? Uh, beginning of it was probably about midway through the third quarter where I just simply said, "Feels like we're going to lose this game." <laughs> <laughs> How about that? There you go. Well, uh, unfortunately, you, you prognosticated correctly. Uh, we certainly weren't, uh, none of us were wanting that. Um, but uh, you ended up being apocryphal. So uh, let's go with Trey Neal. Trey, what did you have from our text talk this week? So my text talk this week is from Josh, um, since he's not here. He said, we're beating ourselves. First of all, pause. Second. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, that was the, the theme. It, it felt like, I think he said this early into the, the second or third quarter, it just it felt like we were kind of giving the, the game to him. Um, I thought we played pretty clean throughout most of it in the sense of I didn't really have any gripes with the offense. I didn't have any gripes with the play calling and things like that. But the execution on probably five to seven plays, I think, cost us so. And, and it was our off fault. It wasn't what Arizona State did anything special. So that, that that's my tech talk for the week. Yeah, we definitely beat ourselves. We'll talk about that. Even their oh. coach said they didn't deserve to win. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah. How yeah. about that? Their coach said they, <laughs> they, they he got out coached. They played awful. But uh, hey, we were still able to beat that team from uh, Orlando because uh, they're pretty. They made enough mistakes for us to win, basically. Yeah. yeah exactly. exactly. All right, Andrew, do you have a text talk for us uh, this week? I was trying to search through here, but all the ones that I like, I can't say on this show. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can't you can't beep some of them or no? Well, mine after the game <laughs> was beep, 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 beep. Oh. We should have won that game. <laughs> so yeah. I think that was everybody after that game for sure. <laughs> So we are uh, E for everyone during the show. We are not E for everyone during our text thread. So, Especially uh, when thank- it's a game like this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, thank you guys for – I'm doing yeah. something and I happen to glance at my phone during a game and there's, there's like 150 messages in this group. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Thank you for yeah, we're either- be in the group. <laughs> we're we're talking s one way or the other right either in a good way like like lf go you know or it's like what the are we doing so um either way you're going to get a healthy uh healthy dose of e for explicit so go I've ahead got, ben. i've got one more that i i wanted to say uh it, and because because i know we're going to talk about it but um it was uh, and it, as soon as i say it we're going to know what point of the game it was but that was probably Tim Harris's first costly decision as a play caller. Uh, we're definitely going to talk about that at the end of the half. And, I, and right after that, I said, you can't call that play there and put Dylan in that position. So certainly that could set up a further conversation later in the show. But that's, uh, you know, that's certainly a play there that uh, at the end of the first half that we want to get back. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, obviously, UCF lost 35 to 31. Um, so that puts us at four and six and two and five in conference still in contention for a bowl game. And I, I think this was the hardest game that we had on the, uh, on the schedule. One of the things I I said last week was ASU is UCF. Like we play very similarly, uh, both defensively and offensively. Um, uh, ASU was without cam, uh, Scadaboo. So it would have been interesting to see how their running game fared, um against us with their their best weapon um but i mean you know i always talk about stats i've talked about stats on nightline i've talked about stats on um you know this show quite a bit but statistically we should have won the game if we talk about statistics let me just throw these out here and the only reason i'm saying this is because again we should have won this game by all accounts right first downs UCF 26, Arizona State 18. Total yards, 406 yards to Arizona State's 260. Passing yards, 229 to Arizona State's 161. Rushing yards, 177 to 99. Um, Third down efficiency, 6 of 13, so just under 50%. However, uh, Arizona State ended up at 50%. 
And here's another one, fourth down efficiency, two of three, which in my opinion, we should have either been two of four or three of three. And we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit as well. But even time of possession, 3120 to 2840. Now the first half, we absolutely killed them on time of possession. Um, it was uh, it was just about a 10 minute difference in time of possession. So that tells you how often Arizona State possessed the ball in the second half um, and, and how long their drives were uh, for their scoring. So it was definitely a tale of two halves. That being said, we spotted them 14 points. Um, and probably, I'll, I'll be honest with you, had we not kicked the field goal um, and went for it on that fourth and two, um, I think we probably uh, we probably um, spotted them 21 points, to be frank. So, um, but again, George O'Leary used to say that, um, you know, a game is decided in three plays. And to Ben's point, I think he said like five plays earlier when he was making that point. I, and that's about right, right? Because we had every opportunity to win this game, even through the mistakes that we had. We just continued to make them. And the big thing for me in the second half is we didn't look like we wanted to win this game. You know, where Arizona State was was pulling out the stops. We started off the game like we did. And by that, I mean being aggressive in our play calling. Um, you know, at this point, we're at a point in the season where it doesn't matter, right? It's no time to play it safe. Let's go ahead and and, you know, be dangerous. And we did pull out some crazy plays. We had that flea flicker. Uh, pass that went a long ways uh, during this game. But by and large, you know, when the game mattered, we we got conservative again towards the end of the game. And whenever you do that, whether it's a defensive stand or whether it's offensive play calling you, and you've got the lead, uh, you're not playing to win the game and you usually end up losing. But that's just my take. What did you guys think? Well, it almost felt like it, it, it almost felt like I don't know if necessarily the uh the belief from the players necessarily, you know, came out of the team. It, it just seemed like, you know, there comes a, a certain point in seasons and we've talked about it so many times, like in the 2013 season, for, for instance, like there's a, when you're able to pull out games, close games towards the end, even despite some mistakes, I mean, this even happened in 2017 a, a lot and, and certainly in 2018, but like, but the 2013 season comes to mind because there were so many close games at the end. And what happens when you win those time and time again is that you have this belief that you're like, it's you, you have this belief and poise about you that we can, we can pull this out. And when, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know the exact number, but it's something crazy by now. It's like probably about, seven or eight games in the last two seasons under Gus Malzahn that we have, that we have, that we have been close. We have had opportunities to win the games and we don't win them in the end um, based on a mistake or something happening. Like when that happens time and time and again, it's the flip side of that. It's the belief that, like, what are you going to do to mess this up? What's going to happen? Like, if something good happens, you start to say, well, I don't know what that, that mistake is right around the corner. And that, that little doubt is in the back of your mind when it's, when it's on the other side, um, you're always finding ways to win because you know that that opportunity is coming. You're playing much loose, much, uh, much more loose than, um, than your opponent is. And I feel like that's what we've seen from not only the players at times, but certainly the coaching staff and the play calling at times. And we saw it in the second half. I mean, um, just that, uh, you know, I believe that Tim Harris called a complete game last game. I'm not quite sure that uh, he called every single one of these plays. In particular, uh, the the um, the fourth down, they decided to go for it in the fourth quarter, I believe, early on in the fourth quarter. And we saw an R.J. Harvey wild night package when, let's be honest, it might have worked at the goal line against lesser teams the first two teams of the season first two games of the season but it's not it's not going to work in that position when you have no threat to pass the ball at all i mean if dylan risk is the guy handing the ball off to rj harvey i think it's a different position that we're putting it in again i'm not being paid millions of dollars to 
to uh, coach football games. So, I mean, who am I to question a guy that's done it as long? But by the same token, it just seems like if I – if we know about what the play, the way the play is going to go when we see RJ Harvey take that direct snap, uh, I mean, it just just feels like God love him. I mean, uh, he can't always just will his way for for three yards every time, which we needed three well, on that. Play, so, I I think for me the big thing there is that we showed it once, they called the timeout, and then we showed it again, right? So yeah, the idea well, no adjustment. Yeah the the idea there is that we're going to get an extra blocker by going wildcat right and that we're gonna be able to tough it out but it's like if you're gonna do it on that play when it's fourth quarter and you're trying to get the two yards why not do it when we were driving to score for a touchdown and we were 35 yards out like to me it's like i'd rather take that chance earlier than later and uh to your point um you know dylan risk they were spying him this game after last game which was smart he did not have as many options to to tuck and run, although I think he was a little bit more hesitant this game to do that than he was uh, against Arizona. I don't know why, because uh, there were opportunities for him to to pick up the ball and and you know keep the option. Um, but at the same time, it's like at least he's a running threat. You've got R.J. Harvey as a running threat, and Risk has clearly established himself as a passing threat. 24 for 34 this uh, game, so 70% again, right? Um, only 6.7 yards per pass, but, um, you know, overall still a competent uh, passing threat. When he had stuff and he needed to go underneath, he went underneath. When they were giving him the long ball, he went for the long ball. Uh, Kobe Hudson, you know, if we're thinking about plays that mattered in this game, to me, it's Kobe Hudson, um, that drop pass of his, um, you know, obviously, um, obviously the the two special team snafus, right? The punt, the the block punt, we were not set. That would have been a good time for a timeout um, for us to reset for that punt. I mean, should we have to do that? No, but it ended up being result it resulted in someone who came free and was able to block the punt that turned into a TD. And then the other special team snafu right before the half. Okay, so our guy who's a freshman is back there. He catches the ball. This is the second time this season that we saw somebody have a snafu. You would think that we would have that figured out because remember somebody else ran out, took a step out, and then came back in and kneeled. And I think it was like two games ago. You would think they would have gone over that with our returners to say, hey, look, when you're on kickoffs, it, it doesn't matter if you drop it. If you pick up the ball, you kneel, you still get the 25 yards. If we do that, we come, we come out, uh, you know, we go into the half with a lead. Um, and not only well, that, for not 14 point, we don't look, we, that turned into a 14 point swing, right? Because you had that. Then the next, uh, the next play, we put Dylan risk in a situation in a tight window, um, where he's throwing across the middle. And, you know, we've got him in slants. That's really the play. And it just happened that we motioned the guy. And exactly when he motioned him, uh, when we motioned yeah, our guy to the left, left, it put it right in the middle of it. So a little bit of bad luck in there, too. But, again, we, you know, we have goal line offense. The, the thing is, is get your yard. You don't have enough time to go the length of the field. Get your yard. Preserve, uh, preserve your um, lead going into the half. I mean, I, I don't understand that, right? And don't put it, don't put Dylan in in that situation either. Yeah, I, I didn't want to interrupt you there when you were talking about uh, all of that, all of those mistakes. But the, um, I think uh, even going back to the kickoff um, uh, that was fumbled or or it was you know it was muffed or whatever, and he took it out. Like, a, I, I can't remember his name, and 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 Aiden probably Jones. just what's his name? Aiden Jones. Aiden Jones, and he probably doesn't want me to remember his name right now, but um, <clears throat> but like, so you have a freshman, like, so one of the things that Gus said in this post game press conference when he was asked about that, like that 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 happening, was, yeah, we 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 made we we told that it was going to be a fair catch, um, and so I actually had my back turned, I didn't even see it, um, and and that's fine, but if you were planning on fair catching it, why? It, you're on the road, like 
why isn't Trent Whittemore like back there? Like, why isn't he the one catching the fair catch? If he's not, he's not going to take it out. Like somebody with more experience, even if Trent drops it in that situation, he has played enough football that he knows that he's he doesn't he doesn't have to take it out in that situation. You put a freshman back there on the road against Arizona well, State. Pe- people have been complaining. People have been complaining about putting Trent Whittemore back there all. Yeah, you like, know what they've the, been the complaining whole... about though, Roger. What they've been complaining about is that he fair catches too much. If your goal is to fair catch, yeah. then maybe he should be back there to fair catch. Like I, I'm just saying, like, I, like, I, whatever. Our fans, fans complain about everything. Like, what is yeah. Gus listening to the fans for? Like, why is a freshman in that situation? Is what I'm trying to say. And then, and then, speaking of putting freshmen in a tough situation, why are we? <laughs> yeah, I am yelling at Gus. <laughs> but speaking of putting a freshman in a tough situation, it's like we got we got less than a minute left and 99 yards at that point. It's like. Like you already said, I mean, what are we, what are we trying to pat? What are we trying to prove? Like, we think we're going to make it 99 yards in less than a minute. Like just because, why? Because we had a, a, a hail Mary the, the, the week before that was from the 45. Like, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's crazy how all of a sudden we go from being up 10 and it, we should we should have been up by more. Uh, I mean, go from being up 10 to all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're we're down going into the half uh, so quickly there, um, and it was just backbreaking. Well, like we I mean, okay at the at the it, you know we came out okay in the third quarter. Like we didn't come out guns blazing, but we weren't awful in the beginning of the third quarter either. Like, but our defense did enough to kind of keep us in there in the um, in, in the beginning of the second half. But um, it, it just so. The- so to correct yeah. to correct the name on the freshman, it was Christian Peterson, by the way, who uh, made the mistake. But that being said, to your point, we got we got them out on downs. Um, we scored a touchdown on the next series. Then we kicked a punt that was blocked, gave them points. So that's seven seven. So that's seven unearned right there. Then we kicked a field goal. We were up 10 seven. We should be up 10 zero. They punt. Um, we score another touchdown. So it's 17 to seven. It should be 17 to zero at that point. <clears throat> then they score a touchdown. So it's 17 to 14. Then we have the interception um, for a touchdown or I'm sorry, that interception is the touchdown. So it's 17, uh, no, they score 17-14. Then, then we have the interception, and it's set all of a sudden, you know, by and, the end, it's – and the missed field goal, 17-28 to 28 ASU. So – I'm going to stop after this. I want to hear from Trey and AP, but, that, like, during that touchdown, obviously, with that drive was extended by ASU. I mean, that, that, t- that touchdown drive was extended by the 15-yard penalty of the face mask, which he – I, I I love the extra effort by Najee Kelly, but holy cow, he almost ripped his head off, his head yeah. off on that one. And well, he didn't let go. That was that yeah, was one problem. I, mean, it, I don't know if his hand got stuck or something, but that was crazy to watch. I I I've, I've never seen. I personally hadn't seen many face masks like that. Where I I honestly thought I was like, do they have the ability to like throw somebody Did out? Of the I'm not gonna lie. I thought head? the same thing. I thought the same yeah. thing. I thought he could so, do it. And that's rough too. I mean, we had we had him right where we wanted him. I mean, there were it was like a, it was going to be like a ten yard loss. And even if even if he doesn't tackle him there, like if he doesn't grab him by the face mask, we were definitely about to sack him. It was no matter what. It's just it was just a shame that it got extended there, and it just all seemed to kind of fall apart the rest of that half well, after that. I, 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 let me say this about that: having played defense, and Trey, I don't know how you feel about this, but there are times when you got somebody, you're trying to get them. And you're grabbing for jersey, or you're grabbing for something just to slow them down, so that more tacklers can get to you. And and you can grab somebody's face mask. I've done it before. Usually you let go. You don't spin them all the way around. And his neck's doing like this. But you know, yeah, um, that was <laughs> that was so your yeah. Screen wasn't like the most perfect time right there. Was awesome. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. That was so. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry. So at the uh, so at the end of the day, you know, though, like I'm I'm OK with him grabbing the face mask, to be honest yeah. with you. I mean, granted, we don't want to do that. But what's crazy about it is he didn't let go. And I mean, he swung him around and the way that kid's neck angle was going, uh, it was like, it was Ooh, that could be really bad. I'm trying to remember this play. Maybe I Nig- Nigelic Kelly, our defensive end, 
uh, the guy that transferred from Miami oh, against Sam Levitt, the quarterback. Our defense oh. basically had the quarterback in the second quarter. Like he was running for his life. I mean, he was really just going further and further back, and then we just couldn't quite tackle him. And then our defensive, yeah, our def- defensive end, right? He's or a defensive lineman basically tried to tackle him. He slipped him, and he he just yanked on his helmet. It was crazy. Yeah. And yeah, was, defensive what, end. Yards, probably. From yeah, the spot that, of that, uh, extended, that extended the drive. That ended yeah. up scoring a touchdown. Um, and, and again, I think that's what that's kind of what I was alluding to. It's one of those things where I'm not mad at him for grabbing that. Like you said, that that happens. Um, just you want to work. Trying to grab something. And yeah, you're just trying to grab something, that. especially especially when you're in. Because I don't think he was in the best football position is what they say. Like he was in an awkward position. So it's just like, I got to grab something to get him down. And it just. His finger fell. didn't get stuck or something, which made him hold on to it a little bit longer. Exactly. I've had that happen and broke my finger before. Accidentally. Yeah, exactly. well, and then the other, the other part about that is Nigelic Kelly is much taller than what Sam Levitt is. So when he's reaching out, trying to swing uh, to grab a hold of something, you can, you just feel whatever you feel. The first thing that you touch and you just kind of hold on. I don't blame him for that. It is what it is. The only thing I would say to that is, you know, bro, you you got to let go at some point, right? Uh, you, you know, that's that's the one thing I would say. Now, yeah. that being said, as far as defensively, this this team did a really, really good job. And, and one of my text talks was, we're doing so much better, especially with Dalen Dodson uh, maintaining the edge because our defensive tackles in the middle – have been getting pressure the last four or five games, and they were pushing Sam Levitt out, and it's turning into more sacks because we're actually maintaining the edge with our defensive end. So that's something this defense is doing a lot better, and it shows. I mean, 260 yards against a P4 opponent. Yes, they were missing their starting running back, um, but they could not – they can't – We at the beginning of the season, we wanted to stop the run. Our inside defensive tackles are stopping the run. Uh, Lee Hunter wow. is – Lee Hunter's yeah. The yeah, he's he's eating up two offensive linemen on his own every single play. I mean, that guy's a menace. You don't see you don't see it as much in your stats, but he's constantly there in hurries. He's constantly pushing the offensive line back, which is causing the quarterback to roll out either left or right, and they're running right into our defensive ends. The difference is this game or these past few games is that Dalen Dodson. And the defensive ends, which is why Dalen Dodson has stayed in there, um, has been maintaining the edge. Uh, Malachi Lawrence is back. Uh, He was injured, but he's back. But he's not playing that because Dalen Dodson has done such a good job on the edge, maintaining it and getting sacks. You see him, he's all over the freaking field. So that's a combination of our interior defensive line stopping the run, getting push on pass, uh, pass protections, and our defensive ends uh, maintaining the edges guys this defense played pretty well the only thing that i that i really w- like question is again on the defensive back play um is going to be when we had that double coverage against tyson and i mean you have to make you have to you can't you got to make that play you know yep. the, the 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 guy the part where we left him one-on-one in the end zone and he went to the pylon you know that's something everybody practices you leave a guy like that on a defensive back one-on-one you try to play press and you get shook you know it's it's going to happen that that i expect what i don't expect is a 50 yard bomb down the field where the safety is late coming over the top and uh our db is just not there and not looking for the ball. He got his hand up, which is good because he saw him looking back for the ball. What he didn't do was look back. But our DBs played fairly well outside of that play. There was maybe one other play. Um, so defensively, this team did enough to win this game. I mean, they really did. You really, it, it really should have been, right? It should be 17 points that they put on the board. I mean, they put less than 100 yards rushing, and this is a running team. On, a, on 165 yard or 167 yards passing, this was a good, good team. RJ Harvey did his part. 25 carries, 127 yards. He was slowed down in the first half, uh, but he picked it up. 15th, uh, I think, consecutive 100 yard game. 5.1 yards per carry. Three TDs. He is now second all time in rushing TDs and six TDs away from passing Kevin Smith. 
Um, so, you know, again, RJ Harvey did what he needed to do. Dylan Riss, 24 of 34. Bad for RJ Harvey. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, what a waste I, of, of, your of senior year season. Yeah, like, I, I just feel bad for him because, like, if we were winning, I think they would be talking about him more often, obviously. Um, and I just I feel so bad for him because he's having a great season, but he's getting completely overlooked. I mean, they did point it out a few times that he leads the Big 12. They, you know, and I think he's second or something in the nation. He's pretty close to that anyway. Top five, yeah. at least. Well, he's second to Ashton Genty of Boise, Boise State. Yeah, but he's not getting talked about at all for like the Heisman, any of that stuff, which he should be. He very well, I mean, he should be. Yeah. I mean, he should be, he should, if we were winning, he would probably be pushing a all a first team All American, second team yeah. All American. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if he's pushing for Doak Walker for sure. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if because of our season so far, I don't know it's if just he's so disappointing. The whole, I mean, I haven't been on here since. The, I think we, we were doing the preview the last time I was on here, right? Yeah. And I was saying Kansas and, and uh, UCF in the Big 12 title game. Well, that didn't uh, <laughs> didn't quite right come to fruition. Um, <laughs> hot take. But, uh, I, you know, that was kind of tongue-in-cheek. But but this this whole thing. But, it wasn't. You know that you were not being tongue-in-cheek in that. What's that? I said you weren't being tongue in cheek in that. Come on. Well, I, I, that's what I was hoping for, but <laughs> but what's going on right now? Especially, I'll, I'll just give you my very easy synopsis of this game. I can tell you who didn't do their jobs, who didn't do their part. It's not. There's a lot of people that did do their part in a game like this, or we wouldn't have been up on the stats. We wouldn't have had possession, time, and all that stuff. Like. When it looks on the stat sheet, you know, when you should win the game, there's people that did their job. I already said that. I know. I repeat myself all the time. But um, but the missed field goals is a big deal. The questionable calls. Uh, and I think Gus had some calls in that game. I really do. Oh. Like you guys said at the beginning. Because there was some weird stuff. Um why are you throwing the ball at all going into halftime? There's no reason to when you're you're leading. Like there's a lot of bad decision making, and I thought the the bad decision making had kind of like gone to the wayside after the last the space game, the last game where where it, we were on fire, everything yeah. worked right. It was everybody was. I mean, just it's. That's not the way that it is, though. I think that that like set us up for disappointment this game, because Dylan Risk could have never had the game that he had the last game. I mean, period. Your very first game, you go out there and just you're an all-world quarterback. It wasn't gonna happen again. I mean, it could happen again, but I don't think it was gonna happen two games in a row. Your first game on the road, starting. Blah, he had blah, a great blah. game. He had a he great did. game. Had, had zero really touchdowns game. and one interception. That one interception, you know, I mean, quarterback rating of 71.1 at that mm -hmm. point. Yes, he was 24 or 34. That's awesome, but no touchdowns. Um, well, I mean, let's be real. Every time we got into the red zone, they put your Curry Brown in. I don't right. know if you noticed that or not, but if we got into the 20 uh, by the 20 well, yard line. at one time. So yeah. Jacory Brown only carried one time in the game. I know, I but know he, he was still he out there handing it off. That was, I don't know. I mean, I was at a wedding. I, I was like trying to watch. I haven't watched the whole thing over again, but I, there's definitely things that I remember um, from the game. Hold on, um, Andrew. Is, isn't our age, is, at our age, isn't it more likely to be at a divorce party as opposed to a wedding? <laughs> it was a niece. <laughs> <laughs> it was a niece, yeah. Um, but, uh, I don't know, man. I really thought that the, I thought the play calling and everything was going to, was going to be a lot better. Um, the infamous wildcat thing, like everybody knows what's going to happen when they see the wildcat, nothing ever happens besides RJ Harvey gets the ball and runs. He can throw. He was a quarterback. That's my... That's my big gripe with it. Is he, he did throw last year? 
Yeah, he hadn't done it this year though, and and so they know every time he's going to come out there, he's going to run straight up the middle. Blah blah blah. Especially you know, and, into and, game not on the line, but you're pushing game on the line. They're, they're not throwing RJ. They're not throwing the ball with him. I know. Yeah. No, I get it. And and he's good at running the ball. I I, I get it. But to your point, what you just said though, AP, is that he's going to run the ball up the middle like that. The that's like ninety percent of that Wildcat right now is run, him running it up the middle. Like there there's is other no things you can do from the Wildcat. Ball. Yeah, there's other things you can do. From yeah, the, there's a lot of things you can do from the Wildcat. A lot. You can yeah. Reverse. Well, and I know what you know. our, our I mean, you our want to run the end around reverse, right? Well, our wild our wild Wildcat package. Uh, is one where we're we're pulling somebody to help fortify the middle to push through the middle. That's that's our wildcat package. Every time that we run it, right? It's designed that way, and we've got an extra blocker uh, in there as well. And they just didn't get it done. Um, it's the same you thing know, every time though. Like, that, well, that's, really I bad. agree. And my biggest same problem, problem, my biggest problem with it, uh, period, is the fact that we called it. They called timeout. They got to set up their defense for the wildcat package, and we went we went out there right, uh, again with the exact same package. That's that's what I don't I, that's what I don't understand. It's like yeah, okay, you if you would switch that up during the timeout, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. basketball and late game situations of basketball all the time. You come out with a with a look, and they the other team calls a timeout because they see that that set that you, they, they, they think you're going to run and then you switch it up. Like you depend on that timeout and you, and you switch it up. Like that happens in basketball all the time. It's a, it's a diversion tactic. You're right. trying to see what they come out as, you know, on defense or whatever. Right. So um, the other thing is I, I kind of mentioned it earlier, the missed kicks, those two missed kicks would have been very important in a game where we lost by what uh, four points. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I understand me, our kicker left in the middle of the season, blah, blah, blah. But no, like, no, no, I wasn't even going to go there. What I was going to say is um, he had the leg for the kicks, right? So I understand that. I don't know what they're getting in, in, in practice. Both of them dinged off of the uprights, right? So the 47 yarder, the, my problem with the 47 yarder was we had a fourth and two deep in their territory We had the momentum. We could have, at the very least, you know, we would have picked that up and gotten an extra, I don't know, minute or two off the clock, even if, and gotten closer for another field goal if we had to do that, right? But it's a 47-yard kick at that stage in the game. To me, we're that deep in, in, in the end zone, or I'm sorry, in their side of the field. You just, you run another play. You get, you pick up the two yards when you got someone who's who's averaging five yards per carry, and that was after, that was after basically being shut down in the first half. You go out there and you run a play, and you get the two yards. I mean, we've been doing it all game long. No matter what, whether you do it through the air, you do it on the ground, you go get the two yards. We we got we were two out of three on fourth downs. They couldn't stop us on four downs. And even, even the announcers were like, you got to think this is four down territory, right? And when they trotted the field goal team out there, like they're like, what the heck, right? And all of us were like, what the heck? At that stage in the game, you go and you don't put it on your freshman kicker who, you know, again, that's not an easy kick based on where it was. It wasn't in the center of the field. It was at the hash, right? So – he had the leg. I get it. I just questioned. I don't even question the decision on whether he should should have if he was the right kicker to do that. Yeah. I question the decision more on whether we should be attempting a, a kick at that point anyway, because at that point, you're only up six points. They score a touchdown and it's over anyway. You might yeah. as well just go for it. I that, get taking that, the point sometimes. I mean, I get it where you want to do that, but I don't know, we've got other kickers, too. Uh, we've only seen one, I think, during game play. No, he's the second one because we had Boomer, and then there's Ry- uh, Riker Casey, and he's pretty good. Like, I don't, he's been he pretty solid the, all season. He's still on the ri- roster, Riker Casey. I didn't even. See yeah, I think, or maybe it's not Riker Casey. Who's? Uh, maybe I'm thinking wrong. Uh, whoever our kicker was, hold on, I'll tell you. 
Um, you know, we had Boomer, but then there's a, a, on the roster is Kevin Carrington, who's a junior. Yeah, I think. I think and Grant Reddick. Grant Reddick. Grant Reddick. Grant Reddick. Grant Reddick. Grant Reddick. That's yeah, he's the one that. Yeah, he was the kicker Grant in this Reddick. game. Yeah. In this game, right? Grant yes. Reddick was yeah. the one that missed two field goals. Yeah. Yes. But so, he's also been playing. He's also been playing. You know, pretty much since Boomer left. Um, which, by the way, uh, Boomer update. Um, for those of us that that said something was wrong with him, uh, he finally came out. He had surgery. He had a issue that basically he had for um, a year and a half. So there was Maybe definitely something train, wrong. So. Yeah, still in the transfer so, portal. So fi- uh, by the way, Grant Reddick's first kick, fifty-seven yards, barely hit the upright. Had the leg to to mm-hmm. hit it. The forty-seven yarder. Again, put him in a bad position. Again, barely hit the upright, and it went off. So he kicked a seven-yarder. Is that right? In the the first half, half. yeah. I'm I'm not mad. Yeah, I didn't. Um, I didn't see that one. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not really mad at that miss. Again, that's a that's a big kick. Uh, Just miss miss kicks like drive me nuts though. Like who you tell? That's supposed to be easy points. That's that's why you do it. It's easy points. You get it on the board. And you move on, you know, like. Oh, I mean, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. That's why we've like, been really kick lucky kick. to have good kickers, though. Yeah, we've been really I mean, lucky. That's, if you're on scholarship to be a kicker, you a, a 47 yarder, you need to make. You need to make yeah. those. You're in college. I think, in my opinion, I'm it's, not your only, it's your one job. You had one job. <laughs> Correct. And anything <laughs> under 50, you should 99 percent of the time make. My opinion. I mean, barring you know wind crazy snap like a perfect snap perfect hold you should make that 57 that's what you, your pros are doing that so i'm like yeah. okay you know what if you miss it and he barely misses it i'm not he's not hooking them or shanking them like he barely missed oh, so he definitely had the leg for it too yeah he had so the leg okay oh. maybe he, he he missed the 57 yarder or he he made the 57 he missed he the missed 57. So the one of the kicks that was that he missed. missed was the 57 yarder. Yeah. Okay, well before halftime. Okay. So the, that, that whole bit. that whole that whole sequence I thought that they were like honestly I I didn't see that one. Um, yeah, the two so, misses uh, AP were 57 yards and 46 yards. So they were both they were yards, not chip shots. You should be able to 46 make 46 you should make. I agree yeah. with that. I, but I, it's still not a chip shot. And he had another story. Yeah, he the both of them he had the, was the the one basically that would have pretty much sealed the deal for us. Yeah, right? that was the one in the in the in the end or in the second half where it was 46 yeah. yards. That was the one that he missed, but that was that was after, as Roger was talking about, it was after the what what a lot of fans perceive as an opportunity to just go for it on the 35 yard line and just try to try to, you know, the get game. the first down with, you know, the best rusher in college football to get two yards with him. You would have thought that that was possible. Right. And, um, look, and at look, that look. point, we would have just had a lot of momentum to go ahead and win the game, regardless if we would have went on to score a touchdown or not getting that first down in that scenario would have been huge. All right. So that's se- that sequence, oh, right? Dill, Dill, Oh, the, the 98, stu- 98 studios <laughs> or what, yeah. what, what was it? The, yeah. It's there you go. Hot. So, um, Y'all so it, it was, warm in here. yeah. Dylan nice. risk run for four yards to the a- ASU 33 Second and six, R.J. Harvey runs for four yards to the ASU 29. Third and two at the ASU 29, R.J. Harvey runs for no gain to the ASU 29. Then it's fourth and two at the ASU 29. I'm sorry. You had four yards, four yards. Even if you ran the ball, they were wore out at that point because it was a long drive. There's no way we shouldn't have been able to run those two yards. If you go off tackle or outside, they would have uh there's no way that we shouldn't have do that. Now again, that's to me at that point in the game, um, you know, at that point in the game, to me, with that much time left in the fourth quarter, there's no way I I would have kicked that field goal. I would have went for it, especially at the 29 yard limit. Huh? How much time was left? 
Um, I want to say it was like six or seven minutes. Oh, wait, 9.44, 9.33 in the fourth. Nine. No, yeah, not nine minutes. I didn't understand. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. That uh, doesn't make any sense at all because you know you're going to get at least one more series, right? So at that point, up. you go for it. Yeah. I mean, if anything, it's 31 28 at that point, too. I mean, we're like, I mean, we're, we have a chance to kind of step on their throat and get it done, but it's a shame. Yeah, I, all right. Like I said, enough I, of that. Question, I, I don't think the offense was bad. I don't think the defense was bad. I think we lost off the punt, fake punt. And questionable coaching decisions. But to me, that's what we've been saying for, what, three years now? Like, this is this is power four football. It You win and lose off of coaching decisions. You win and lose off of small things. If you're going to take a shot on the one-yard line, I, I don't mind it. I'm not going to say it's bad. But those shots that you see people doing are on the one are max protection. You're throwing a one-on-one deep ball down the field. And you're just hoping that, hey, you know, maybe they make a mistake, you get a PI, or you get a long 99-yard touchdown. You don't run a RPO slants. Slants, yeah. Yeah, because that's what happens. You're They're loading the box because you're in the – so everybody's in the middle. And it's crazy because the, the kid that intercepted it, he wasn't trying to intercept it, but when you're running man coverage across the middle, that's what you're trying to do. So it's – He literally ran into the ball. Like the ball exactly, ran into him. Exactly. And, and to <laughs> me, that's – what I've noticed, and, and it, this is not even just us, just in high-level football is one in these kind of situations, and the, and you lose games in these situations. You can't be up three going into half and throw that pass, let alone the circumstances of a true freshman quarterback. A I, I don't know if Tim Harris is a rookie play call. I think he's called plays before. But I don't a young think most rookie. kids on Madden would throw the ball at that point. No, yeah. you, and I'm gonna be honest, we wouldn't. But Those if you play, do, you're, you're not going that. School kids playing Madden wouldn't wouldn't throw it. Exactly. If they were gonna throw mind. it though, Andrew, they they wouldn't throw a a, a, a slant in that. Slant. No, they're, th- they're throwing a, a vertical. <laughs> they throw a hail mary, but yeah, yeah, that's what they're gonna sure. do. Um, and that's what's frustrating to me is just you see it like we see this every weekend, and you go to the fourth down call, the wildcat on like fourth and two high leverage situation. Who do we want to get the ball to? Everybody in the country knows we want to get it to RJ Harvey. Right. Why are we just making it even more obvious saying, hey, we're putting RJ Harvey at Wildcat. He's never really thrown it in these situations. He's never given the ball on the jet sweep in these situations. So he's running what? Some version of power or something inside. Yeah. So we're going to put everybody inside. Let alone you do it after a time. And you guys are harping on it, but like, this is elem- like I wouldn't even say elementary. This is just when you're in the situation, I it it blows my mind that you can do this kind of play calling. And we I find us saying this multiple times a season, and it's getting old saying this. Like, what kind of play calling is this? Why are they doing this? And yeah, it's it's a little hindsight from us, but I'm not gonna say and say and say we're the average fan. We understand football. We've played football. Like we know, Ben. You even made the comparison. That's like coming out in a set. They call a timeout and running the same set. You wouldn't even do that in basketball. Like that's yeah. that's just it's it's elementary stuff, and that's what's frustrating to me. Um, that's because crazy. this game we should have won, and I know I chose us to lose, but I didn't think we'd come out playing well offensively. I didn't think we'd come out playing well defensively, and we did. So I think whenever we do that, we should win these games, and we lose off of you know special team blunder and, and coaching, and that's that's the frustrating part to me. Yeah, and I, I even thought think, I, I wasn't even, on the show. I didn't didn't get a chance to make a prediction or anything like that. Obviously, but I I really thought we had a good chance to win this game, especially yeah. with momentum from last yeah. game. I was expecting to win this game. I was expecting Andrew, to win I, it until I said, the last touchdown was scored. To be honest with you, yeah, so, Andrew. I said last week was our our annual, you know, Gus just perfect play calling per space game. You know, we always win the space game. Um, and we were going to come back to life and make the mistakes we, uh, you, we'd we made all the beginning of the season. I didn't really see that offensively and defensively. Well, and I was surprised that. by that. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. even as a guy that, that never played football at any level, like, I, I mean, I remember in the first half, it might have been the first drive of the game uh, for, for UCF, um, you know, there was a – I think it was a short third down, and 
Dylan Risk is in the game at that point, of course, as he should be. But And, and he fakes the handoff, and he throws a perfect ball over the middle to, uh, I think it was Randy Pittman at the time. And like that, whether that happened on the first drive or not, it was like it happened at some point in the in the first half. Right. And so with fourth and two on the 35 yard line, I mean, if Dylan Risk is in the game just to hand the ball off to to R.J. Harvey, at least you have potentially in the back of somebody's mind, like a linebacker or whatever it may be. They'll remember that he threw a dime on a you know fake handoff not too long not long before in a very similar situation, and so it's just correct. It's and just even like that out of that team. situation, whether he whether he was forced to hand the ball off to R.J. Harvey, no matter what he saw in the defense, I wouldn't have even cared. It was just the fact that like you took him out, you took all threat of throwing the ball yeah. at all out the out of the out of the. You know, game. I just, it's just after you already showed it to him to all of our points, you know, like it just feels like, I don't know, it just feels like that was a Gus, I'm going to be very stubborn thing. And you can't tell me that they didn't go into that timeout and he made the final decision on that play. I just, well, you can't I, I can tell you this. I can tell you this for at least, and that may be the case, but the vast majority of this game, Gus did not call the plays. And I can tell, and he may have jumped in. After that throw that turned into a, uh, you know, a pick six or whatever. But I can tell you this because I've been watching when you show him on the sideline, when he's on the huddles, all the players are surrounding Tim Harris. Uh, Coach Melzon's not in the middle of that huddle. And then when they break, he kind of walks off all pissed off and whatever, right, on the end. So I can tell you this for certain. Tim Harris is calling the plays. There are some rumors in the rumor mill. And again, these are rumors unsubstantiated that uh, that uh, Terry and I know Andrew hates when I say this, but that Terry and uh, and Gus are a little bit at odds. Terry actually kind of put his foot down and they're at odds uh, at this point. Uh, this is from people that are boosters inside the program. So I won't say good. <laughs> yeah, and I, I agree. And I, I, I think that, you know, if if the rumors are to be believed, there's other boosters inside the program that are saying that Gus is going to retire at the end of the season. I hesitate to say that um, because that would take a lot. He'd be walking away from a lot of money. I mean, at this point, he really doesn't need it. I don't it, think money but... matters to Gus. No, I, I don't think matters. so either. But I, I do think that it would eat his there's craw. Money. I think it. I think it would. I think it would eat his craw that if he ended his career on a on a note like that. To be honest, you know what I mean. So, yeah. well, well, take I it with a grain of salt. But, at this point, well, well, I hope this, that he doesn't like. If he stays, if he stays, I would really love to see Gus Malzahn go into the general manager mode. And let somebody be a somebody else be named the head coach. You can solve that problem that. pretty easily. He There's that. schools that are doing that this these days. It, it's probably what needs to be done. He's not going to uh, do that though. That's what Saban <laughs> did. But Saban, no, he's saying like he becomes a GM and the GM of the of the organization of the team. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's a head coach, but he's more of a CEO role. Right. Which is what we I said like GM on a, on a, for him on a pro team. It's the same thing. Like I, I don't think I think Gus and Saban are different because I think Saban has always he's been a CEO even when he was coaching. Gus has been very hands on with his yeah. with offense, but the recruiting and calling plays and yeah, he he he's always been. Like deep in, I remember like even when I was in high school, Nick Saban came and recruited some. Not Nick Saban, but like he was recruiting kids at our school who were big time players. He never came to Buford High School. Like he didn't. He sent Kirby Smart to come do it. He sent Lane Kiffin to come do it. Like he had already started kind of CEOing a little bit. And then you know on the official visits, you know Coach Saban's gonna come out and and wine and dine. But Gus is out in the field recruiting. Gus is going to see these kids. Like Gus. And, and, you know, Trey's mad. Trey's mad. He didn't get the helicopter in the in the in the fifty yeah. yard line at the high school. You know, football I, I never worried about that. <laughs> I never worried about that. But um, 
like Gus has always been like he's in it. And, you know, that's what makes him. I, I know a lot of players that love Gus because like the players coach and in the sense of he's very involved with his guys. That's a pro form. But as and, we see, and, awesome. and he hires a lot of his own guys and gives them opportunities too. Yeah. That's the other yeah. thing. Awesome. That's awesome. But but I also think, I mean, we saw it with with Coach Frost. You, it's awesome you bring your guys, but that can also be the the downfall for you. It's awesome that you're so involved. That can also be the downfall for you. Like that's you have to learn to you know if it's not working, be able to pivot. You can't keep banging your head against the wall. Like I want to call plays. I want to be involved. Like you might have to step back. I don't think he will just because I think he loves it too much, and he's an older coach that. I mean, truth I don't think I don't think he's got a choice right now. To be honest, I think really not that old. That's the no. I, I mean, older. Yeah, he's not old age wise. I'm I'm saying older you as know, in the old guard. Like he's not he like O'Leary old. He's like I think he's only like fifty seven or something. Oh yeah, fifty eight. He's, he's a good, a good, whatever. Little yeah. bit better amount of years. I just think like just the the age of football is you're going for the young innovative guy. Like that's what people are chasing. I think um, I think if Gus, if Gus if Gus does retire, he'll sit around the house, go stir crazy, and after five years, he'll enough of the stink will rub off of how things went here, and somebody will pick him up at, at a P four school and and have him coach. I mean, at that point, he's sixty three years old. He's still young enough to coach. I could see him trying to trying to polish the tarnish off of his uh, career because I mean, you think you think about it, this man went. Went never had a losing season until last season. Never, in his entire career, from high school all the way up. Now, did he ever achieve the highest highs? No, right. But he was a guy that was looked at as the as a um, as a visionary as far as offenses were concerned. He was looked at a guy that could recruit. He was looked at as a guy who could uh, who always had a winning season. If you hired Gus Malzahn, you could guarantee at least a winning season. And that's gone away. And I think this has been, I can see it on his face. What's that? I was just saying, I'm sorry. We're one loss away from a guaranteed losing season. So, I mean, that's just, yeah. that's, that's, that's where we're at right now. But, I mean, if you know, it happens again, I can see him retiring. And I mean, even a year ago at this time, I remember asking like, not maybe at this time, but after the season, I was like, is our ceiling capped with Gus? You know, like, Yes, we're going to always get the recruiting. And Alan kind of said, like, we're going to get the recruiting booms in the offseason. We're going to get the, you know, the excitement. But, like. Andrew, do you remember Do you remember back in the Nightline days, we were recording when Gus Melzon was hired and the news came across. We were in the middle. I don't know if we were in the radio. I think we may have been on the radio. Um, and uh, Gus Melzon was hired. And. We had this conversation, and I told, and I said at the time, you, were, I, I was not happy with it because it felt like a retread, and that I was our, excited about it. Yeah, and you were super excited about it, and I, and I thought, you know, at the time, our ceiling was, uh, was capped because of that. And I'll say this: Gus gave all of us a lot of reason for optimism. After that, we had the, um, you know, we had the transition into the Big Twelve, which he guided us into, and. You know, uh, a lot of other teams didn't do as well. However, BYU is doing a heck of a lot better this year. Um, that was unexpected. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, he's done some good things, and he kind of earned my trust as far as what he could do with the program. We were getting the recruiting rank rankings. But at this point, I think for the fan base as a whole, um, you know, we – we want direction and what we're seeing is mediocrity and we don't see any reason to see hope. And I think who if you get, though, that's the big question, like who, who's out there? Who, I mean, and, well, and, and the timing of it too. We don't have that much money to spend. Well, I mean, we, we would, if he retired, right. If we negotiated right now, we would owe him about $12 million if Terry fired him. Right. So, well, it really, isn't you know, that much compared to other contracts, I remember well, reading his contract when that when he signed, and I was like, "Oh, the buyout's freaking nothing compared to." Well, the original buyout was nothing; like it was hardly anything. I think that oh, buyout got a little bit yeah. bigger when he. I, I think he did. He had a re, they re, not re-signed or maybe renegotiated it. He re, yeah, he extended well, his contract. 
They yeah. extended his contract in the middle of the night after the Baylor game. If you guys remember, Terry did that to, to kind of stabilize the program, right? The thing about it is, is, you know, the first contract that he had, he was with Auburn and he was making was $20 million dollars off of Auburn, right? Yeah. And at the end of the day, he took less from us um, and took more from Auburn. And so at the end of that, that contract cycle, when we resigned him, then he took, you know, market value at that point for our program to, to coach here. I don't, I don't think he's going to get fired though. I no, I don't, I don't think we can afford to fire him yeah. now, whether he retires, you know, even if he retires, who do you get? Like, who's, who's well, out I mean, there? The, like, the good news is uh, like that. That's not our, like, it's not our search to make, but like, I, I would say though, on the, on, the, in regards to Gus in general and whether he retires or, you know, is talked about getting fired or whatever it may be like, whether Terry Mahajer likes it or not, like his standing and his career here at UCF is tied to Gus Malzahn. A thousand percent. It is tied to Gus Malzahn. I mean, he uh, arguably without, without any like true knowledge of the situation, like he arguably got hired because he said he was going to bring in Gus Malzahn and he did. Um, and, and, you know, has this past relationship with him. Like, at this point, whether it's now or, you know, during the bye week or or after the season is over, like UCF fans at a bare minimum need like a complete press conference statement from Terry Mahajer. And and he needs to address the state of this program because, I mean, it is just as much tied What's going on with our athletics program is just as much tied to Terry Mahajer as it is to Gus Malzahn and the football team. Obviously, we know football drives a ship. So so what's going on with the football program is also tied to Terry Mahajer. And so not just Gus Malzahn. So, like, I mean, when you when you think of it that way and you start to question everything, it's very easy to start to say, well, what has Terry really done here? And you could say ushered in ushered in the big 12 uh, transition, but, but uh, how far did Danny white get that down the football field? Did he have one yard to go to basically get it into getting into the big 12? I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's he had, he had, he had one yard to go because exactly. the but it's a tough comparison, obviously, because Danny white is the golden boy here and he should be, and he deserves all of that credit, but it's, and he's a tough act to follow, but there's a reason why, like, you know, he's, thriving at Tennessee and we're and and we're maybe rightfully questioning like what's the direction of our athletics program within the Big 12 well, let me let me have to make a blockbuster football coach uh well, hire somehow uh, well here's here's here's, here's the to. thing they'll have to, if he retires they'll have to negotiate right so it won't be 12 million dollars maybe he takes six million dollars right we're going to get more money but there's a bit there's another thing beyond that if you're going to go try to hire another P4 coach. And that is... You're in the P4, you have to. Well, you... Uh, offensive coordinator, you could get a P4 offensive coordinator, but as far as a head coach, right? Um, one of the things, there was an article actually that came out today, and it makes complete sense. There's less people that are going to be part of the coaching carousel this year, right? Because... Next year, we've got $20 million everybody has to fork out to the players. Yep. So when you're when you're looking at that, it's just like us, and I told you guys this when, when this news started coming out in the offseason, we're basically going to be net neutral as far as the increase that we get, right? Because the amount of money that we're going to get, most of that's going to go to the players. Um, so we're going to be where we are today. So if that's the case... And let's say we we do six million. Um, then either a booster is going to have to step up, and we're going to have to be like the Auburns of the world and go and get someone like a Yellowwood. And we we're starting to get those level of boosters now to say, hey, let me supplement you to offset and and get the coach that you need. But even then, Malzahn at his current pay level is being in the is in the bottom third of the Big Twelve as far as the coaching is concerned. So you're going to have to do like the old, the big, the UCF of old, which is go get a hot coordinator who may have, uh, who probably hasn't been a head coach, hire them in here and hope that they can do it like a Dillingham was right. So 
uh, for Arizona State. That's what we're going to have to do. That's what most of the Big 12 schools are going to have to do because we're at a disadvantage uh, based on that 20 million. We're not going to be able to operate like FSU did or anybody else. So that's what, um, that's what most, but I think like that's what most schools do. Unless right. you are Texas, Bama, like the elite echelon blue, true blue bloods, like USC, like those peer recognition, you can spot them. If you played sports or not, you know what that logo is. Those are the only schools that can truly just go get a head coach. If you lose your head coach, you can go get another elite level head coach. Um, otherwise, you need to you have to be innovative. If you want your program to take those steps, you have to go get an a elite coordinator, whether it's offensive. That's kind of where most of us lean. And that's what I would prefer in this day and age of football um, or defense. I mean, you look at Georgia. After Mark Rick, people were like, who do you go get? They went and got Kirby Smart. They didn't go get, you know, a dabble. They didn't go get a big-name coach. Now, Kirby was a beast, and he he was ready. Um, but but you have to do that. Oklahoma fell into Lincoln, right? Like, it's you have to go get the hot coordinator. You have to go get the, the innovative guy. And I think even we did that with Coach Frost. Even after Coach Frost, Coach Heupel was a hot name coming in to do the recruiting. Like, that's what you have to do. I understand why they got Gus because, again, that that huge transition in their eyes of going from the AAC to the Big 12, Gus was the perfect person for that, in my opinion. But I also think he's not the perfect person to take us to that next step if that's where we want to go. I th- I do think that we we gained relevance as a program in the national media more quickly because we had Gus Mel's on. I, I do think that's the case. Absolutely. <sighs> Gus was a household so, name as a coach. I mean, like, but but like, if you want to, if you want to bottom line it though, like Gus put this entire season on his, like, on his shoulders. He he was the one. I mean, it was not that long ago, guys. We're only talking about August and September here, where he's sitting in that press conference before the first game of the season, and he's he's clearly saying that. The if we fail this season, it is going to be my fault. Like, I mean, he rearranged the entire staff. He changed roles of the entire staff, hired a guy that he's already fired by now, but like still hired a guy in Ted Roof, Ted Roof. And and he I'm not mad at that. I'm not mad at Roof. He did what he was supposed to do. That's not the point I'm trying to make. What I'm trying to say is that it, it, he he emphatically took back the play calling. Now he's given that back up. And all along the way, as the losses have piled up continually, and I know that we only get the press conferences to see. We're not sitting in the offices with them every day. But like it just continually looks like he's searching for a plan that he cannot find. He just... Uh, they, they uh, after a while, and this is happening across the country at programs that are underperforming, FSU being one of them, but certainly here at UCF, where like you're searching for anything in the press conference that just makes you feel like there is a plan to correct this. And the things that are being said in these post game press conferences, like again, it's 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 after a t- really tough loss, but. I, I just everything's ringing hollow right now from Gus, and I just feel like I, it doesn't feel like there's going to be a way that he recovers from this. And maybe I'm wrong because this is a new era of college football, and you can just get about 60 new players in here next year, and maybe it, it all of a sudden you catch lightning in a bottle. But it feels like even on that side, the recruiting side, the stuff that he is elite at is starting to kind of crumble at least or at the very least chip away at the edges right now. And so once you lose that, what value do we have to the program? And I just, I, I just I don't, like, the, like with us as a program, like I struggle saying that Gus took us to another level because I don't, I think there's a lot of other coaches that could have gotten us to where we're at right now. I don't think Gus well, has ma- magically made us, like with the level we're at right now, I think we were already trending that direction. Now, is it good for Gus as far as just recognition? Because people know who Gus is, I guess. But like as far as building the program to where it's at, I think we were already headed there. I just think I think we've stalled because of Gus. I'm not saying well, it's I, I just I'll, think I'll, 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 I want to break this. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
I want to break this into two conversations. As far as building the program, I would argue that. And the reason I would argue that is what Gus has done for us as far as um, the program is concerned. He leveled us up on NIL, on recruiting, on all of those different areas to make us a better program. We were we were very G5 as far as those a- aspects of the program. As far as running a big boy P4 program and being able to do those things, I think he did help us there. As far as what's on the field, I also think that we progressed from game one um, in defense, which is what the big focus was for this year. Um, all season long. I do think he put his faith in KJ. I did too at the beginning of the season. I think where he kind of waited too long is, is not is figuring out the risk thing. And I also think the last two games, um, uh, to what to at least the last two games, Ben, Gus didn't look like he wanted to be there. And the reason he didn't and didn't have a lot of answers or anything, I felt like was because he wasn't the guy in charge. So well, when I see his body language coming away from the huddle, he's not even in the middle of the huddle when the offense is there. He's kind of off to the side. He's walking. And here's the thing, you know, ESPN too, this last game, they were focusing in on him. They weren't showing Harris at all. And so all you saw, it became really blaringly obvious to me that you see him in the periphery outside the huddle, walking away, looking down, looking upset, looking like, Ah, oh, this should be my team kind of thing. And I saw that at the at this last press conference too. So I, I just feel like if that's um, how he really feels, he needs to retire for sure. Well, and I and and I think he might. And I think Terry put his foot down. I think the boosters put his foot down, put their foot down, and we finally have big enough dog. Because you saw, we talked about it on the show. Two major boosters talking about five million dollar plus boosters for this past year made them made their uh made their displeasure known on twitter Hmm. and yeah and as an ad you can't walk away from five million dollar plus a year boosters you can't do that not at ucf so um not at any program really that's that's a lot of money right one was a 10 million dollar booster the other one was a five million dollar booster you don't walk away from people like that so i think trey uh timed out or something so i'm gonna uh i'm gonna remove him or oh, he removed himself that works um so so yeah all, all right let's go ahead and pivot we've got some hoops to talk about and i'd like to keep this show under two hours we're in one hour and 13 seconds uh or 13 minutes already um so as far as the score predictions for next week we don't have one i think we're all going to say we won against the bye uh hopefully that prepares us for west virginia who did win last week uh, who's I'm been a still planning on being there though. I will be there with my family. So, yeah. So don't, don't be Josh. Me. Don't be Josh, Ben. That's all we're going to say. Don't be Josh. All right. Uh, as for this week's score what predictions, Trey, uh, well, he, we always lose when Josh attends games. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so he's banned. Um, so as far as, uh, this week, Trey did win, uh, because he's the only one who picked ASU, uh, 30 to 23. As far as being closest to the pin, had we not given up those 14 points, that would have been me. Uh, but all of us are losers. Trey wins this week just simply because he picked ASU. So, My score um, is cool and I, I was mad because I wanted I wanted UCF to win because Allen offered up stakes if we won the game. So, uh, which I still haven't gotten since the Nightline days. I'm just putting that out there. All right. right. So um, that that being said. Trey already yelled at his cloud uh, for this week. Let's uh, get into the Big 12 football scores this week for Week 10. West Virginia beats Cincinnati 31-24. I was not expecting that, um, but West Virginia has been a wild card all season long. Uh, Kansas beats Iowa State 45-36. No way would I have assumed that. Iowa State seems to be on a, a little bit of a, a, a streak. I thought um, for sure we were losing that game. My camera's gone all wacky all of a sudden won't focus. Get really close to it and then back up. No, put your face up to it. <laughs> Let's get real close with <laughs> close and personal. There you go. See? And he's fuzzy. Crazy. It's dark in here. Oh it. man. Uh, all right. You may you may have you may have to unplug and replug your camera, bro. 
All right, Colorado beats Texas Tech 41-27. Colorado is looking to be a a good team this year, maybe a championship, a Big 12 championship team. There you go. Um, TCU beats OSU 38-13. 38-13. No, I'm saying like Colorado potentially winning the Big 12 is crazy. Like we have have significantly – more talent from top to bottom than those two teams, probably combined. Uh, uh, Colorado, no, I wouldn't say that. Oh, we a, a thousand percent. <laughs> besides, besides, besides their quarterback, Shadur Sanders, the receiver, and the receivers. What? A, there's no none the of receiver those defensive guys. back guy that plays both ways. Yeah, I mean, now they have the two best players on the field. I agree with that, but. Top, Besides that, top of the roster to the bottom, I can no, say I, I can see that. I don't believe that. There, there's no way you can sell me that because that's what Gus is supposed to be good at. And Deion Sanders, all he's gotten was portal guys. And well, guys he's gotten he's, he's gotten got some of guys he, out of his roster. He's gotten he's some a of our recruits. motivator, though. Unfortunately, I do not like Deion. I loved him as a football player. I do not like him as a head coach. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, you think? Do you guys think? Nebraska's more talented than us. Top to bottom no. roster. No. They smoked Colorado. Yeah. Did they? And like yeah, that's it wasn't even a contest. It wasn't even close. And 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 again, like that's what I never mind. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> I mean, you may you, look look when we played Colorado, uh, you know, it was a close game there too. It, it would if we had Dylan Risk, would we have won that game? Probably. If we had I Dylan Risk and a bunch of other that. games, would that's, we have? That's we, most would, of my point, like top to bottom, our roster is good. It's again, and I, I said it, it's 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 a quarterback league. Sadly, um, yeah, they have utilization of the players and Not one of them, and, and that's play what, calling. Yeah, like it, it true, it, uh, it truthfully is, it's play calling and your quarterback, and obviously the skill guys. But like, I don't think we have a shortage of skill guys. Dylan Risk has shown us that in two weeks. Yeah. Like, we have guys. You know, well, Jacoby Jones certainly alone, has stepped. Going back to the whole Gus thing, that situation alone, bringing in a, a portal guy that cost us all kinds of money, and then finding out your best quarterback is your fourth string guy. Like that's and finding out way too late as well. And yeah, and, but like, and as far as the rumors go, finding out because some other uh, quarterback didn't want to go in the game. Right. We might not have ever found that. By default, yeah, like right. by default, we, we may not have out. ever it's found that good. out. Yeah, so and, and that's, that's the problem. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I, I didn't mean to get in this rabbit hole. It's just to me, it's mind-boggling that Colorado and BYU are probably going to be playing in the conference championship, and I don't think anybody would ever think they have more talent than our team. Now, at positions, yes, overall. That's not even a question. Like that's that's mind boggling, especially where we're at. I'm sorry, Roger. Go ahead. I, I, I didn't mean to go on my It's all good, bro. All right. So TCU beat OSU, who has I think mailed it in officially, thirty one or thirty eight thirteen, which is interesting because that was another team that thought that they were going to buy uh, for the Big Twelve championship. BYU beats Utah at twenty two to twenty one in a hotly contested. Uh, contest that seemed to uh at least utah's ad came out and blasted the big that's 12 big basically rivalry, that's a long long time rivalry right there hated rivalry I, yeah it, long, it is but it, but at the same time there was a, a very very questionable call at the end that kind of handed the the win to byu so that made it even worse the ad i mean i wouldn't recommend stomping uh, my feet around uh, you know, uh, the way that he did, but at the same got time, a yeah. Fine. <laughs> well, got I mean, like he, this 40,000 or something like that, I think. For that. You know, who the you know, you yeah, remember who called. the AD is, you remember who the AD is, right? Mark Harlan, the cow's former AD. Mm. Oh, okay, so there you go. Uh, Big 12 is now down to three ranked teams. BYU is up to number seven. Colorado's up to 18. And KSU is up to 20. I don't expect much out of KSU uh, going down the stretch. So it'll be interesting. Um, with that being said, let's go ahead and pivot. Pivot. 
All right, UCF hoops. We've got some more to celebrate there, although it was done in an interesting way. UCF beats Purdue Light. Uh, what is it? Fort Wayne, seventy-five Purdue to sixty-eight yes. <laughs> to improve to two and zero. Um, according to Trey, UCF is a basketball school now. Key stats and for the game: a basketball I, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, except we talk for an hour and 20 minutes about football. So let's, 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 let's keep it real. But um, that being said, key stats, Ivy Curry uh, had 18 points, three assists this game. Keyshawn Hall, 14 points, 12 boards. Uh, TM played well again, 13 points, six rebounds. Benny Williams, 8.6 rebounds. UCF shot 42% from the field, but just two of 20 from the three point line, two of 20. Um, the, the, um, you know, that was, we shot, I think 24, 25% the last game, uh, that we played. Um, we shot about the same, uh, from the floor, 42%, but I think it was like 25%, uh, from the behind the arc last game. Purdue, um, shot 43% from the field and, um, had uh, and 27% for three. Uh, difference was basically uh, the free throws. So, one thing we've been screaming about about this UCF program going back to uh, gosh, uh, BJ Taylor days has been the free throw shooting. We were 20 of 30 uh, from the from the line. And again, uh, you heard it in the post game. <laughs> What's that? 23 of 30. Okay, 23 of 30. Excuse me. Um, but still, this is now turned into a strength of the team. The, 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 this team can drive the paint um, when the shots aren't falling. We have good defense. We have the ability to drive the paint and draw fouls, which extends games and keeps us in games if we can continue to get those, um, uh, those free throws, right? Those, are, those, are, uh, those, are, those will deflate, deflate runs very quickly for opposing teams. Um, UCF out re rebounded Purdue 44 30. We're not known for a big, um, you know, being a big team on the glass. So don't, don't get too excited about that. We have to get better on the glass. Uh, but against big 12 competition, we are not going to out rebound teams. Um, and, uh, 50, we outscored them 15 to seven on turnovers. Now we had, we had one of the things we talked about last week was fast break points. And the fact that we had two on ones last week that, that weren't very successful this week, we were 12. Uh, we had 12 fast break points played a lot better once we got out and ran. Um, but Purdue outscored UCF in the paint 40 to 36, which is crazy. A big part of that was we got to the line quite a bit. Uh, UCF plays FAU next week, but this was a, this was a solid win. Uh, but when we start playing better teams, the defense will keep us there. We're going to have to shift uh, to playing off the ball or, uh, you know, driving the paint more quickly. We cannot get out to starts like that from the three point line and, and continue to do that. That's that's what I'm hoping for against FAU, who does shoot well and shoots well behind the arc. What do you guys think? So I was there in the building. Uh, our very own Josh Lazar was very nice to um, give me his tickets. And so my son and I went on Friday. That's night. why we won. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because he wasn't there. But the um, but yeah, so my son and I went on Friday night. We had a great time. Um, the I got to I got to give kudos to the student section. They really do show up well. I mean, it's it is a it is a, once we switch gears and the opposing team is going to that end of the trying to score on that end of the court. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why we're a really good second half team um, in at home. Um, they are, it is a unique student section and one that um, may take a little bit to fill up at, at times, but once it's filled up and they're rocking, they really are loud. So I'll give, give kudos to the student section. Uh, but overall, I thought it was, it was, it was a way that uh, Roger laid it out, but the, um, as UCF fans, traditional UCF fans, especially we stand until the first UCF point is scored. Unfortunately, in this game, we stood for over six minutes of <laughs> game clock. Um, and, and I, have never, was bad. I have never seen a crowd more relieved at a free throw made, uh, <laughs> 
as Jordan Jordan Ivy Curry's uh, free throw made with uh, I think uh, fifteen fifty four left in the first ha- in the first half, and so um, it was it was wild to watch their start. And what was crazy about that is when he did make the free throw, we um, we were down six to one. He made both free throws. We were down six to two at the end of it. His trip to the line, but they only scored six points in that, in that run because our defense for those first five, six minutes of the game were, was just really spectacular. Um, The problem with the offensive end is that in the beginning of this game, we settled for a lot of those three pointer. Like it, it seemed like we weren't, we weren't really attempting as we should have to get into the paint and create. I think the guys like, Darius Johnson, especially, but we've got other guys on this on this team as well. Jordan Ivy Curry is one of them. Uh, Keyshawn Hall is certainly one of them. But if we can drive drive the ball to the hoop and and create, like we've got guys that can create for themselves or or you know have a nice pass and create for their teammates. And once that started happening, especially in the first half. Um, we kind of got rolling a little bit and it was a close game at half. Um, you know, it was only a one point game and it seemed like it was the opposite in the second half where we were, uh, we started to pick up our scoring a lot. As you mentioned, Roger, we were, um, much more aggressive at driving into the paint and, um, you know, the inside passes for dunks were just really, um, great. But it did seem like something happened. Maybe shots started falling for them, but something happened with our defense that they were able to take advantage of. And and I, I understand, uh, you know, as 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 people who are not from the Midwest or we're not paying attention across every single of the three hundred you know plus programs and college basketball that we look like a team like uh, Purdue Fort Wayne. And we're like, all right, we should, we should handle them easily. And at times in this game, it looked like we were because we do have a much, you know, much more talent than they do. Um, But with 11 new players on a UCF squad, um, they returned their top eight scorers from last season. And so they had a lot of continuity on their team. They're picked to win the horizon league this year. And what I saw from their point guard and um, number 32, their center, uh, Mulder was his name. I mean, they, they had some dudes on that end of the court that, uh, that came to play and they were trying, they were, uh, trying to make a statement here in Orlando. And luckily we were able to kind of stem every run that they had, um, and, and wound up closing it out really well toward the end, which I was, I was very happy to see in both games that we've had in the regular season here. Obviously Texas A&M was just a spectacular way that we closed that game out, especially on the defensive end with Texas A&M. Now this game against Purdue Fort Wayne, it seemed like while we made great stops down the stretch, uh, it just seemed like every single time that we had to get a bucket, we were able to get that. And all and almost all of those buckets came from actually all of them. I could say probably confidently that they all came from, you know, in the paint on on layups or, uh, you know, great uh, passes for dunks. Uh, TM had just, you know, in the last 10 minutes, he kind of stepped up and shined. I hope that that is a sign of really good things to come from an offensive standpoint from him. He had a beautiful little baby hook shot uh, with about five minutes left that um, that extended the lead for us. And then he had a, had a couple of other really good moves that displayed his touch around the basket. So I'm just excited about watching him develop because I think he's going to be one of those really special players for us. Um, and so overall, in the end, I think we finished out the game very well. And um we have got to figure out a way tomorrow night on Tuesday night against FAU to, um, to not get off to such a, just a tough start offensively. We have got it from the jump. We have got to try to push the envelope and be aggressive on getting downhill with Darius Johnson and trying to get him in the paint to try to create for his teammates um, and kind of put them on their heels from the very beginning, because FAU is the type of team that can certainly score with the best of them. 
And so uh, we're going to have to be sound defensively, but we cannot, you know, we cannot take five over five minutes to score our first points in this game or we're going to be in trouble. And uh, that game's at home luckily as well. So hopefully we can get off to that better start, but um Overall, I, I like the what, I, what I'm seeing from this team. They do seem to really play for each other um, with a lot of new faces on this team. It's always good to see those signs. Um, they, they kind of start to settle into their role. So I'm excited to see what we have um, coming up. And that's my basketball All right. recap. Um, <laughs> well, like, Penn's basketball recap. <laughs> <laughs> We're zoned out. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have anything else to add to that? Nope. Okay. Ben, <laughs> not a basketball guy at all. Y'all know that. Um, <laughs> I know. I'll start watching basketball in February. Well, I think it's uh, as, as Ben alluded to, uh, UCF does play FAU at, at home uh, tomorrow because we're recording this on Monday night. So that's going to be a big game. I hope you guys catch it, depending on when Nobra puts this out. You may already know the score. Um, that being said, Big 12 basketball, uh, every team is still undefeated besides Houston and Baylor. Houston lost to Auburn, a very good Auburn team. Baylor got throttled by Gonzaga, which is interesting. Um, Gonzaga is a good team, but, uh, I expected Baylor to play better. Um, we still have six ranked teams. Number one, Kansas, number seven, ISU, number eight, Houston, number nine, Arizona, number 12, Baylor, and number 17, Cincinnati. Uh, UCF did get 20 votes in the AP poll this week and are ranked currently number 35. Uh, if we do go ahead and win, um, against FAU, that should put us pretty close to a top 25 um, type of uh, situation. So let's hope for that. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and pivot again. And uh, let's talk a little listener love. So uh, a couple of uh, things. First one is on uh, Twitter, Mario Paez at Lonely B UCF. That should be a very familiar uh, name to... Uh, Andrew from uh, Nightline. Yep. Long time uh, listener. Long time listener and, and supporter always of commented. us. Yep. Always commented. And uh, so Alan was out in, in Arizona and he was asking where all the, uh, all the uh, UCF listeners or UCF people were. And uh, Mario chimed in and said he was there at the game. So I hope you enjoyed. Um, I, I heard the tailgating was terrible, but the uh, bars bar scene that was close by uh, was very, very good. Then we had um, Phil Wallach, 3472. This was in response to Josh's um, pregame uh, segment that he always does on shorts, uh, where he interviews a, an opposing fan, and he, he found an Arizona State fan to interview to say what his score prediction was. He says, how, instead of who, uh, cares, uh, put your time, energy, and attention into something that truly matters in life. Sports are just a distraction to further divide us, which was wow. interesting, an interesting take. So, okay. uh, Phil, thanks for taking your time to care enough about Josh's uh, short to provide that response. Uh, Vixie Edits responded, bro, what? Uh, <laughs> and then responded again, Did ASU all the way. It came from your, his mom's basement by chance? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, but like uh, live from my mom's basement. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, ASU fans did come to our uh, uh, to Josh's uh, defense and said, "Bro, what?" And then he says, "ASU all the way." So thank you, um, Vixie Edits for uh, for that response. Thank you, Phil Wallick for whatever that was, and Mario <laughs> Paez. Thank you, uh, our Paez. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Mario Paez, thank you again for being a longtime supporter of both this show and Nightline and all of the things in between. So uh, with that with that being said, let's go ahead and pivot again. Um, so while Ben was going on his basketball tirade, I was actually updating uh, the other the quick update on other UCF sports that Alan does not watch. 
tirade, all right? Tirades well, like I was angry. All right, was angry all right. About football. All right <laughs> I wasn't angry right. about You're right. You're right. I shouldn't have said tirade. Um, <laughs> uh, since I, I used pontification earlier, your uh, your pontification on UCF basketball. Um, that that being said, <laughs> there's no Allen's oxymoronic stat of the week this week because Allen is not here with us. He's still recovering from ASU, apparently. Um, and Josh is sometimes funny fact of the week is also not here this week. They both uh, get L's this week uh, for this segment. However, big shout out to Alan for putting together um, the notes for us again this week, despite not being able to be here. He did not up- update the sports that he does not watch because he does not watch said sports. So I was updating those as we were going. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to um, do these as much as I can. Um, so, Men's soccer beat Coastal uh, Carolina away two to one. So that was uh, Coastal Carolina usually has a, a pretty good team. And remember, we are in the Sun Belt Conference. If you're wondering why are we playing Coastal Carolina, but we did beat them away. However, our season did end in the first round of the men's soccer championship. Uh, we played number six JMU, yes, James Madison University in the Sun Belt Conference and number six in the country in soccer in Huntington, West Virginia, and lost 1-2, to two, so not a bad loss. Um, they closed the season 7-6-3 and three overall and 5-4 and four in conference. Again, folks, the Sun Belt Conference, I know it sounds crazy, but it's actually a really good soccer conference. We told you that at the beginning of the season. We've got some work to do. Women's soccer, again, did not play, as Josh reminded us last week. Their season ended early, and they didn't even get to play in the championship. <laughs> um, women's volleyball. Um yeah, tough, tough sledding again in the Big 12. Um, women's, uh, women's volleyball played away in Fort Worth at versus number 18 TCU and lost in straight sets, 0-3. to three. They followed that up by playing Waco uh, in Waco versus number 17 Baylor and also lost in straight sets, 0-3. to three. Um and this is where I got to where we were, which was uh, women's soccer, or I'm sorry, women's basketball. Women's basketball did beat Marquette 57-50. I got to catch that game, which was interesting. They are uh, 3-0 and for the season, uh, but it was interesting because I had 2-0 and because the other one was an exhibition game against Iona. But Marquette was a, a tournament team last year and a good basketball team. We were absolutely rocking them going into the fourth quarter. This was a like a 16, 17 point lead going into the fourth quarter. Uh, ended up beating them 57 50. So, um, very, very good start, very hot start for the women's uh, basketball team. We have some different scores. We had our leading score from last year, point guard tra- transferred. Um, and uh, looks like we, as good as she was, we got an upgrade at the point guard. Uh, point guard position um saturday uh, they will next play saturday november 16th in the addition financial arena at 4 p.m uh eastern versus stetson for the mental health award awareness uh week so make sure you're supporting not only the team but also the cause and that'll do it for this week another frustrating uh football week a lot of questions about the future of Gus Melzon. Um, I do still think that this team can can win out and win a bowl game. I think we've got the talent on the field. I do see progress of this team, both defensively and offensively. Uh, obviously, Dylan Risk was the spark that we needed. He could actually throw the ball. Um, we'll see how we do next week um, or after the bye week. This gives us another a little bit more time to kind of um, – I think it's a good thing because I was worried last week – after coming off Arizona, if we had a high, we went into ASU and, and kind of, uh, you know, just didn't do what we needed to do. I was going to say a term that Andrew would say, but I can't because it's E for uh, this shows E for everyone. <laughs> um, that being said, um, you know, I, I think this is a good week for the bye week to prepare us for the last hopefully three games of the season. Um, I have seen progress, but it'll be interesting to see what uh, what happens after the season is over with regard to Gus Melzon. Did you guys have anything else you wanted to say? 
Happy I just Veterans want to say Day. thank you for having me on again. I, I didn't even participate that much tonight, but it was just fun being here with y'all while you were doing your show. Um, I'm so glad yeah. you were with us, AP. And I, yeah. I do have to, again, shout out. You didn't mention who won the, uh, the, the Iowa State. Women's Soccer Championship. I didn't because we didn't even play in the in the tournament. So I I mean, what is, What's up with that? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I was looking for – UCF and I didn't find them on the tournament thing. So, do they not involve everybody in the tournament? That was kind they of don't. Weird. No, no, they didn't qualify. Okay, I, I think like they don't take the bottom. Is it three or four teams I of the conference? I think they do that in baseball too, but or yeah. maybe it's basketball. Is it basketball? Women's soccer yeah, is pretty big in, baseball, in the Big Twelve. No, no. Baseball, yeah, baseball, baseball. If you, don't, baseball. If you don't if you don't make like a certain threshold in the conference, you don't even get the tournament. Yeah. So, yeah. shout out to them. Um, but yeah, I was bummed that UCF wasn't even in there. So, um, happy yeah, Veterans that's... Day! To all yeah, Veterans Day. Oh, happy I veterans didn't even to say that. Wow, there, yeah. that was a big, big. I am so sorry. I should have said that a hundred percent. My dad was a veteran. He dressed in his dress blues today. Went to work. Ex-wife was a veteran. Um, this is the hat that everybody. Most wants. of my family too. Um, so. Here, here's I, I have that one too. Here's wow. the here's the here's the here's the thing that I'm going to say about uh, Veterans Day, right? So, thank you to all the veterans that were out there th- uh, that are out there for your service. Thank you to their families because uh, that's uh, something that's a hard life for families and it's something that people forget. Um, and I'll also say uh, for all those that did serve, I almost went to West Point. Um, I had an appointment for West Point, chose not to. And it reminds me every year about all of the things that uh, that I would have gone through had I chosen a military career. And it reminds me of all the things that all those people have gone through when I chose and I had the choice not to. So thank you all um, for your service. We appreciate you. We appreciate your families. Um, you know, Wonderful. and 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 to all of our listeners out there and uh, followers and everything else that are, are veterans, my bad. I totally messed that up because I sent a lot of I sent a lot of Veterans Day uh, texts out today, and I forgot to mention it at the top of the hour, and I should have. So that so being said, we're a team. I got you. Yeah, Trey got it. Yeah. So that being said. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for listening. Make sure you tell your friends. Make sure you're following us. Make sure you're subscribing. Make sure you're commenting, even if it's something that makes no sense. We appreciate I'm you. Comment during the games, too. Yeah, comment during the games, too. Uh, go Knights and charge, charge on. on. Charge on, baby. I guess I'm going to have to randomly ramble for.